Ever heard the phrase, thou shalt not kill? Well, there are more exceptions to that rule in the Bible than you'd expect. Some of you may be surprised to learn that God actually says it's okay to kill a burglar. According to the Bible, if a thief is sneaking into your house and you strike him dead, you have brought no blood guilt on yourself. However, this rule does come with one caveat. You have to kill the burglar before sunrise. If the sun is up and you can see the burglar and you still kill them, that's considered murder and you have to deal with the legal and spiritual repercussions. This teaching can be found in Exodus 22, 1-3, which goes over several rules concerning restitution for theft. This decree comes directly after the statement that if you steal an ox from someone, you must repay that person five oxen if they catch you in the act. Some may find the question of whether the act was committed in daylight to be arbitrary, but similar laws can be found among ancient Greek and Roman statutes as well. In other words, multiple cultures thought there was some logic to this concept. The idea seems to be that in the dark, a homeowner would not be able to see a burglar well enough to identify them, and so their only recourse would be to try to fight them off. In the daylight, however, you could theoretically see the face of the intruder. With this knowledge, victims could publicly accuse the intruder of theft in order to bring them to justice. As a result, anyone who knowingly killed an intruder they could identify would be subject to the death penalty. In other words, if you need to defend your family from an intruder before striking that fatal blow, just remember. Some of the most well-known rules and laws in the Bible outside of the Ten Commandments include the dietary laws observed by some practicing Jewish people and members of certain Christian denominations. For example, some of the more well-known of these restrictions are not to eat pork or shellfish. However, one lesser-known detail of these laws is that observant followers of Judaism typically don't eat meat and dairy together either. This means that items like cheeseburgers are not considered kosher. The ultimate source for this rule comes from the second half of Exodus 23:19, which says, You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Like a human kid? Not a baby goat? Thankfully, the word kid in this verse is referring to a young goat. Even so, this may still seem like a strange law to some. However, it was apparently important enough to repeat in both Exodus 34:26 and Deuteronomy 14:21. Rabbinic interpretation has resulted in religious people largely seeing this verse as an instruction to not combine meat and cheese together, but that seems unlikely to have been the original intent of the law. Some commentators have suggested that this command is actually a prohibition against the pagan fertility rite in which such milk was sprinkled over crops to ensure a good harvest. However, the command's repetition in Deuteronomy is located next to a list of unclean foods, which suggests that a goat boiled in its mother's milk is simply not supposed to be eaten. As such, many commentators believe this was simply a law against cruelty to animals, especially ones young enough to still be nursing. Leviticus 3.17 gives readers a pretty straightforward commandment, which reads, You must not eat any fat or any blood. For its parts, the prohibition against consuming blood is easy to understand. Jews who keep kosher do not eat any animal's blood. Animals that are butchered in accordance with Jewish law are drained of blood, soaked, and salted until they are ruled fit for consumption. The surrounding context of the verse makes clear that people shouldn't eat blood because it is the physical embodiment of the life force itself and belongs to God. Blood on God's altar serves to purge sins, purify the land, and ward off potential dangers. In fact, not eating blood is one of the commandments that God gives to the whole world and not just his followers, which means it's actually a more universal law than some of the Ten Commandments. On the other hand, the portion of the law referring to fat consumption raises a bit more confusion. Are Jews outright forbidden from consuming animal fats such as butter? The prior verses make clear that the prohibition here is against the internal fats surrounding the kidneys and other internal organs, which is often referred to as suet in English. This specific type of fats is non-kosher, while other fats are okay. The reason for this is, like blood, suet is considered a seat of life and should be returned to God rather than consumed. Several of the precepts in Leviticus 19 concern moral holiness, outlining ways that readers can keep the land holy through their behavior in addition to maintaining ritual purity. Some of these moral teachings will be very familiar, as they're also included among the Ten Commandments. These include instructions not to steal, lie, or swear falsely in God's name. In the context of these familiar teachings, you might pause when you see the instructions in verses 9 and 10. In these verses, God's followers are instructed to leave the edges of their fields untouched when reaping and to not pick every grape in a vineyard. Additionally, they state that if you drop a grape or ear of wheat on the ground, you should not pick it up. Unlike mistakes such as spilling salt, there is no superstition attached to this practice. Instead, the moral teaching in these verses is straightforward and compassionate. The Bible is instructing its readers to leave some wheat in their field and some grapes on their vines because poor people deserve to eat too. 
The act of picking up grapes, olives, or ears of wheat that have fallen on the ground during the harvest was called gleaning, and it was a right reserved for the destitute and foreigners who didn't have farms of their own. Here, the law reminds us that it is sometimes our duty to give up some of our individual rights to reduce the suffering of others. For those not familiar with the many different laws from the books of Moses, Leviticus 19.19 is often considered one of the most perplexing. This verse says that you shouldn't wear clothes made of two different materials. For modern readers, this may seem like a perplexing instruction, as it's safe to say that few have ever given thought to the morality of wearing a blended article of clothing. What is it? Wool? It's a poly nylon blend. Do you really like it? No. Bathroom's just out of paper towels. In biblical times, this commandment would have been understood to mean that one should not mix wool and linen. And as with many other such commandments, this one is still practiced by members of the Orthodox Jewish community today. Despite the cultural longevity of this law, it does beg the question, why would God not want people to mix wool and linen? The rest of the verse shows that God also commands disciples not to plant more than one kind of seed in the same field and not to breed two different species of livestock with each other. Together, these commandments make clear that God is further emphasizing purity and a devotion to each thing's individual properties as bestowed upon it by Him, Creator. Keeping animal plants and fibers separate helps to remind the Israelites that they themselves should remain pure and unmingled with their idol-worshiping neighbors. Notably, ancient Israelites used mules, a hybrid between horses and donkeys, so someone turned a blind eye to these particular details at some point in biblical history. One of the commandments that is commonly pointed out as an example of a biblical law that most modern people don't follow is Leviticus 19.27, which says that you shouldn't cut the hair around your temples or trim the edges of your beard. The strict observation of this commandment is what leads some Jewish men to wear their hair with long curled side locks and long beards. While people with this look often stand out in the crowd, this may actually be the point of this particular restriction. The Bible doesn't give a reason why one shouldn't shave their temples or trim their beard, but the commandment comes in the middle of other prohibitions against practices common among other religions, like ritualistic augury or tattoos. For this reason, it seems likely that this rule was meant to make the followers of the God of Israel look different from their neighbors. The Greek historian Herodotus says that ancient Arab tribes who worshipped the god Oratol would shave around their temples and ears, leaving only a circle of hair on the top of their head as a sign of devotion to their god. As a result, it's not hard to understand this law as God instructing his followers to differentiate themselves from their neighbors who practice separate faiths. As the third book of the Bible, Leviticus is primarily concerned with rules and regulations for priests, and some of the most notorious commandments from the Bible come from it. The rules contained inside the book talk about the proper procedures for making sacrifices and instituting new priests, and offer guidance on how to live as a priest. Leviticus chapter 21 specifically deals with the ritual purity of priests, and while some of the restrictions make sense, others seem overly harsh. Priests, it says, should not come in contact with dead bodies, nor should they marry former sex workers, divorced women, or any woman who isn't a virgin. As restrictive as these laws may sound, it gets even more complicated by stating that if a priest's daughter becomes a sex worker, she should be set on fire. In addition to all the regulations regarding women, the chapter also features a distressingly long list of disabilities and injuries that make worshipers unfit to make an offering to God. Among others, people suffering from blindness, walking impairments, dwarfism, a hunched back, scabs, or crushed testicles are prohibited from approaching the altar. Even something as minor as a broken foot is listed as a quality unfit to get near that specific place of worship. From a modern perspective, this discrimination against people with physical features they did not choose just doesn't seem like the teaching of an all-loving God. While the book of Deuteronomy is traditionally grouped as the fifth book of the Law of Moses, it would also be accurate to think of it as the first entry of the history of Israel that continues in the subsequent books Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and the two books of Samuel, and the two books of Kings. This history focuses on the rewards that come from faithfulness to God and the curses that come from straying from Him, as well as the importance of Jerusalem as the only place where God can be worshipped. The central premise of the law book at the core of Deuteronomy is that the Israelites destroy all pagan cults and rituals within the promised land of Canaan in order to make a holy place where they can consolidate the worship of the God of Israel. This results in some pretty wild and incredibly strict instructions that Moses gave on behalf of God. Chapter 13 says that if a prophet tells you to worship other gods, you must execute them, even if their prophecies and miracles turn out to be real. On similar notes, this chapter insists that if your brother tries to convert you to another religion, you must stone him to death. However, perhaps most shockingly, verses 12 through 18 talk about what to do if a town in Canaan decides to worship another god. The instructions are fairly simple. Kill every single one of its inhabitants, regardless of whether they're a man, woman, child, or animal. 
The Gospels aren't as full of specific instructions as the Book of Moses, as the teachings of Jesus typically boil down to loving God, loving your neighbor, and selling all your stuff and giving it to the poor. Likewise, the letters of Paul tend to avoid the nitty-gritty of the law because one of Paul's main goals was conversion of people who weren't Jewish, who might be deterred from his religion if they had to stop eating pork or get circumcised. However, Paul certainly does go off in his letters about who should or shouldn't do various things. For example, he instructed readers not to get married because he thought the end of the world was coming so soon that there was no point. One of the most common targets of Paul's instructions are women. For example, in 1 Corinthians 14, 34-35, Paul says women should not be allowed to speak in church, and if they have any questions, they can just ask their husbands at home. As problematic as this belief system is, things were even stranger back in chapter 11 of the same letter. In this section, he says a woman must cover her head when she prays. The reasoning behind this decision is somewhat ambiguous, as all Paul says is, quote, because of the angels, as his justification for this instruction. While the meaning is unclear, it's strongly possible that he thinks women's exposed hair would be too much of a sexual temptation for any angels observing a prayer meeting. 